Okay, I guess that's my cue to get started. A little bit early. How's everybody doing? Good. So um, I'm going to be talking about a. Uh, is my slides up yet? No. No. So I'm going to be talking about, uh, so in a world of con ephemeral containers, uh, how do we keep track of things? So essentially about how to uh, keep track of state uh, in a world where uh, containers can uh, kind of disappear. So uh, my name is Ian Lewis. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I, uh, I work on the uh, Google Cloud platform team. Um, I'm based here in Tokyo. Uh, so if you guys ever uh, come back, uh, hit me up. Um, I'm on Twitter, so there's uh, uh, my ID. It's Ian M. Lewis. Uh, it's really uh, original. So, uh, so today's today I want to talk about like uh, you know a few things. So I'm going to basically give a, kind of a context of like uh, clusters and uh, ephemeral containers, uh, and then. Um, Talk about actually like uh, the problem of keeping track of things, uh, why that's a problem, and um, and a little bit about how to solve it. Uh, uh, several um, different patterns and ideas about how to solve it, uh, and give some concrete examples, um, and then uh, kind of wrap up and uh, at the end there. So, so just to kind of set expectations, um, I'm not going to be giving you guys like a, a silver bullet or, or something that you can go and, and take home and, and be like, okay, if I do this, then like, you know, my state will be okay and, you know, everything will be all, all right. And so there's no real silver bullets. Like there's a, a number of different patterns and trade-offs that you can use um, to, to deal with, with state. Um, and you actually do use different patterns for uh, different types of state uh, that you want to deal with in a, in a container of, or a cluster of containers. So, ephemeral containers. So, like, so just to kind of like get get an idea of the of the room. How many people like actually n know what containers are? Okay, so like pretty much everybody. Okay, so how many people have actually used Docker? You know, played with it, run the Docker command. Okay, how many people are using it in production? Okay, a few are. Okay, so. So how far down this rabbit hole should we go? Um, so are you using it? Do you have like a, a full like CI, you know, click to deploy kind of thing going on? Who has that? Anybody? Two people. Awesome. Okay, so so these guys uh, are getting their uh, their um, their salaries worth at their companies. Uh, so. So what are ephemeral containers? What are, what are containers uh, in general? So like containers are just, um, you know, they're a technology for, for, um, for encapsulating things and making things easier to deploy. Um, but what does the ephemeral part mean? Like, um, and I'm going to kind of uh, just give a, you know, kind of hand wave over the part of like actually uh, trying to get you uh, into actually using containers. You know, I'm just going to kind of assume that we all want to use them and we all want to, uh, to um, we're all on the same page in terms of actually using containers versus not using containers. And they give us a number of things. So like, uh, they're a great way of doing, of providing isolation uh, between jobs so they don't interfere with each other. Uh, this is more like resource isolation or um, like, uh, Isolation in terms of like them seeing each other. This isn't something like security isolation, um, but you know other things like lifecycle and discovery, like actually uh, you know service discovery, setting up services, uh, doing monitoring and health uh, checking. Those types of things may, uh, become really a lot easier in containers. But ephemeral containers, what are they? They're they're essentially disposable, right? They're things that you can throw away. Um, so that's what ephemeral means. It basically just means temporary, right? So if, you, if you're storing state on something that's temporary, then your state is also temporary, right? So if like that's your, say, your credit card details or whatever, or your customer's credit card details, and you're like kind of 
those containers just kind of go away, then that's that's like important uh, information that uh, that you know your your customers wouldn't really be happy about that. So so I'm going to be talking mostly in the in the context of Kubernetes and uh, and of uh, Container Engine because uh, that's what I know best. Um, you know, working at Google makes you kind of uh, biased in the technology choices. Um, but so, so what it, Kubernetes is basically a container orchestrator. So I, I'm going to be talking of storing state and, and coming up with state in, this, in the context of actually uh, running a bunch of containers in a cluster. So um, running uh, containers on a bunch of different machines, uh, not just on your local laptop or, or whatever. Um, and so Kubernetes is basically a cluster orchestrator. It runs on a bunch of different machines or creates a cluster for you that you can run containers in. And uh, it schedules the containers for you. Um, so if you say, OK, run this container, uh, it will decide where, which actual physical machine to run it on or which VM, uh, depending on the environment. Uh, and um, it's built based on, uh, based on Google's experiences uh, running containers inside of Google. So we run uh, pretty much all of our uh, uh, services in containers. And uh, Kubernetes is an open source project. So it's like an open source project for real. It's on GitHub and uh, you know everybody can use it there. It's not like uh, other ones that shall be uh, uh, remain nameless uh, everybody, um, that, uh, that, are, that come out every once in a while. Um, but uh, so it's really, really cool actually to go to Kubernetes on the GitHub page uh, and uh, see all the issues and the, uh, the um, and the discussion kind of going back and forth uh, between the uh, the developers, um, uh, because it really uh, gives some insight into how like uh, people at Google think and how people at other companies that are really uh, into the uh, going full in on the containers thing, uh, how they how they think. So uh, Kubernetes like introduces a couple of, of different uh, of new uh, terminology or a few terms. Um, one is called a pod. Uh, a pod is essentially uh, a set of containers that get scheduled and run on the on a single host. Um, so uh, it's essentially the atomic unit of, of scheduling when you're scheduling within the container uh, or within the, the cluster. And so uh, when you actually uh, say run this this uh, container, you actually don't really say run this container. You say run this pod, and it uh, has a number of containers uh, defined within it. We also have uh, the idea of a replication controller. And a replication controller is something that like, kind of babysits your pods. Uh, so you basically just say, like, hey, uh, I want to have this many pods. And you give it a template. And that template says uh, gives, is, a, is a kind of a way of uh, you know, a cookie cutter that allows you to like create a bunch of different pods or the, the right number of pods that you need. Um, and then uh, Kubernetes also uh, provides a something called a service. Uh, and this is a way of uh, creating a single endpoint. Uh, basically, it gives you a virtual IP and a port uh, that you can connect to and uh, then uh, have the, the connections load balanced across the, uh, all the pods that are actually implementing your service. And then uh, labels, so you can l attach labels to uh, any uh, any resource. But essentially, you add these to pods, and then you use these to like uh, c uh, uh, as part of a selector when you do the uh, the service. So this when you create the service. So the service uh, ha says like, okay, you know my you know app uh, nginx or whatever is uh, is what's in my service, and so it selects all the pods using the labels uh, to know which pods to actually route traffic to. And so it's basically a, a way of, of uh, managing a cluster of machines. Uh, and it's very declarative. So you basically say, here's the desired state of the, the cluster that I want to do, uh, or I want to have. And it kind of figures out how to uh, make it so. So just to give you like a little demo of that, um, let's see. So this is going to be like pretty small on here. So here's Container Engine. 
so this is like the the easy button, right? So you can start up Kubernetes on like any one of your uh, on like bare metal or on AWS or on like whatever. Uh, but uh, it, the easiest way to do it is to like do it in uh, cloud platform. So if like you're really uh, into that or or if you want to try it out, then it's uh, it's much easier to do it here. So you can come here into the uh, the, the console and like you can create a cluster. Uh, I've kind of done the uh, the cooking show thing and created one already, but uh, just to show you how you do it, like you can uh, you give it a name and the type, you know, the place that you put it, and then the uh, machine type, and then you give it the number of nodes that you want uh, to run, and then it will uh, create the nodes and install Kubernetes on it and and have it ready for you to to uh, actually access. So I've created one already. Uh, so in order to access that. Um, I have a, you have what's called the kubi control command, uh, and you can say things like get pods, and this is basically just an API client. The uh, Kubernetes has an API uh, that you can hit uh, to get all the information that you need about like what pods and services and things like that are running. So here I don't have any pods running, um, so I'm going to start up my, uh, my service. Uh, this is actually kind of a guest book service. Um, So here I'm going to create a, a MySQL uh, pod and service and a, a memcache service. Right. And then, so I've created, uh, can I maximize this? Yes. Sure. Make this a little bit bigger, um, and then uh, create the replication controller for my front end. It's a PHP application, and the uh, and the service for my front end. So uh, each one of these are like different applications. Like so, one's uh, MySQL, one's my, my Memcache, and one is the actual front end PHP application. And each one of them has a service associated with it. Uh, that you can access uh, so that they can actually talk to each other. And so what does this look like in the, uh, in the cluster? So here's a, a um, kind of an overview or, or like a, a visualizer uh, that will show you the state of the cluster. And so here I've got the, uh, I just, these are all the uh, pods and replication controllers that I just created. Uh, this, and this front end part is a service. And uh, this over here is the replication controller. This is my little babysitter uh, that babysits my pods. Um, so I don't have a replication controller for these ones. You can create just regular pods, but that's not particularly advisable, but uh, you can do that. And then you can do things like, um, you can uh, scale. Uh, You can scale the uh, the replication controller to have a different number of pods, and so here I just it's actually too fast, but I just scaled it to to five pods and it started up five pods uh, here, and so it basically just started up two new pods. It just and kept the the old ones around. So that's what it means by basically declarative state. You tell it what uh, how many pods you want it to run, and then it kind of figures out how to get from where it is to where it needs to be. So that's a pretty simple kind of demo. I'll, I'll probably come back to that a little bit later. Uh, so, so where's the state? So I've got this. Um, actually, let me go back and actually show what the application looks like. Uh, so I created a front end that'll give me an actual uh, public IP or public uh, load balancer. And so here's the actual guest book. So if I blow this up. And then, like, start typing some messages. Then I can save those in the uh, in the database, and actually uh, reload it and see that. So, where's the state of, of this application? Like, what? Uh, 
what type of, of state do we have? Uh, I think that there's a, a, a several actual uh, pieces of state. Um, does anybody have any idea, like, like what types of state there would be? Um, so, like, one one is obviously that there's the uh, the, the memcache server has state, so it, it stores like the, the actual database with the messages and that sort of stuff. Um, and we also have uh, we also saw that we have memcache running, so that's that's actually a kind of a type of state. It's a a, a cache that has uh, the cache data in it. Um, that's a little bit more temporary. You can it can go away, and the application will still run, but uh, could have performance implications. You said memcache twice. It's implement MySQL, right? Uh, I did mention the database. That's what my MySQL. But there's also like there was also a memcache that I that I started up. Yeah. So um, and then so there's those two types of states. Uh, there's also uh, there's also configuration for my for my application. So like. Uh, how does my PHP application know where the database is, or what the name of the database is, or um, where the what the name of the service is for the uh, for memcache? Um, also, like, there's one more type of state that's really kind of a an interesting one. Um, so the, the the state of the cluster itself, like, so how many pods are running, and what services there are, and things like that. That's also a piece of state that's uh, that is somewhere. Um, so I'll kind of talk a little bit about each of those. So yeah, so where is my state? Oh yeah, I've, I've basically thrown it away already. <laughs> but um, so the uh, but the so I'll kind of get into the state and stuff a little bit uh, later. But I, first, I want to kind of talk about the difference between uh, containers and images because um, I think that a lot of you are, are pretty familiar with how Docker works, um, and many of you have probably run it on your machines and and done. Uh, run all the, the different commands. Um, but um, one of the things that, that Docker does is um, it allows you to create images, like package them up, and gives you a really nice format that you can put on Docker Hub or whatever. Um, and so it's, and it's kind of a read-only system, like set of, of layers of, uh, of, of actual files that, that, get, uh, that can get built up. So you can... Uh, Usually, you do something like build, maybe push to a repository, pull to like the host that actually executes it, and then like start in a container from the image. Um, but when you're doing that locally, you can kind of like start it up and 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 run it, and then uh, you know either make some changes uh, to the to the hard disk uh, or to the to the local drive or whatever, and then actually like do a commit, like Docker commit or something. Um, and so that's actually saving some state to the uh, to the image itself. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something that we actually want to get a little bit away from if we're going to actually start talking about clusters of machines. So uh, in contrast to, to images, what are containers? Uh, containers are actually the, the, uh, a, um, an amalgamation of kind of a bunch of different uh, features in the Linux kernel. Uh, so there's a few APIs. One is called cgroups that helps re restrict uh, resources for a that our processes can consume, uh, CPU and memory and disk I.O. and things like that. Um, uh, there's also a set of things called namespaces, uh, which you can, you can create a namespace for a set of processes or a process or a set of processes uh, that uh, kind of uh, creates a, a you know, walled garden of, of network interfaces and P PIDs and, and users and mount points and things like that. Um, so this kind of like walls off your uh, your your application into a into a you know a a a box or something, and the uh, then there's a um, a set called capabilities, which uh, features that called that are cap called capabilities that uh, li limit what the user can do. So things like whether they can mount or kill uh, processes or uh, change the owners, etc. So if you use these all together, uh, you can actually do a lot of like really cool things, which is like which is what basically what containers do, which is run processes uh, that uh, that have some sort of resi some resource isolation between them, uh, as well as uh, not being able to actually see each other unless you want them to. Uh, so each one of them kind of thinks that they're own running on their own little box uh, within a box. So in a sense, it's kind of a very inception-like, but it's uh, um, they're essentially processes. They're just running uh, directly on the on the machine or the host that they're running on. 
So when we're using Docker and we're starting up a bunch of different uh, containers from the same image, uh, you're actually uh, creating a, uh, a read-write interface or each one of them has their own uh, you know, uh, file, local syst file system that you can write, read and write to, um, but each one of them are essentially copies of the original image. Um, and so you can't uh, expect that we, each one of them could write that data down or write, write to the file system and then, uh, then save it and then be able to be restarted somewhere else. Like each one of them has different state. And so, um, and when you restart it, like each one of the, the, the uh, containers all start from the same image and so they're all gonna start with the exact same state. Uh, so they need some way, um, so you need to have a system where each one of them can start up and uh, essentially figure out what, it's, what it needs to do uh, to get started or to, to actually uh, do the work that it needs to do. So there's a number of, of, of ways that you can do things like uh, try to um, create state that is going to outlive the container, essentially. And so one of them is you can create a host direct or mount a host directory uh, to the container. So one of them, so what you can do is where the actual container is running, you can mount it, uh, mount a directory to the from the host uh, to the container, and then write to that directory. And when you restart, like when you shut down or restart the uh, that particular uh, container, it will be able to remount that particular host directory and uh, continue on. But uh, there's a downside to this, and that it's only available on that particular host. Uh, you're also uh, going to be uh, you need to have a separate host directory or separate directory on each host or on the host for each container uh, because each container has its own, will have its own state that it needs to, to be able to store. And so you need to man be able to manage those, to, those things, uh, those directories, um, and so that can be uh, pretty unwieldy. So, and the including the, the host directory. Like, so essentially what you need to do is you need to uh, try to get the, the state that, you're, uh, that you want to be able to store or to save like outside of the container completely. So you need to, to be able to store it somewhere else outside of the container, or outside of the container cluster even, um, that uh, where, uh, when you, so that when you start up a container, uh, no matter where it starts up again, you can actually access the data uh, that it needs to, or access the state that it needs to. So we'll talk about a couple of patterns uh, for actually uh, for actually doing that and doing it more uh, in a more correct way, I would say. Um, so one is to basically use network storage uh, that's available to your cluster. So um, the the canonical example is if you use like GCE or uh, or AWS or something like that. Uh, for to run Kubernetes, you can mount a network drive. So in GCE, it would be, or uh, in Compute Engine, it would be a persistent fault or a persi persistent disk. So you can mount that persistent disk to a particular uh, container, and that container can then, or that pod can can then continue to run, um, no matter where it's restarted or moved around. And so this is mu they're mutable. Like you can actually read and write to them. Uh, but and they outlive the container, um, and also uh, very importantly, they're they're accessible accessible from wherever the uh, the container actually happens to be running. So you can so Kubernetes has a number of plugins that you can use to uh, to actually mount disks like this. So like uh, I mentioned, the uh, GCE persistent disks and AWS block stores, but as well also you have uh, like NFS or iSCSI or those type of uh, or like ClusterFS. Uh, there's a number of plugins that you can use that uh, that will allow you to uh, essentially get the same thing. So uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about a few more uh, patterns for actually keeping track of things. Um, so the the actual patterns are, are um, so storing uh, storing outside the cluster. I kind of talked about a little bit. Uh, so you essentially run the, the software that you need to to like store the state uh, completely outside the cluster. And then, um, and so block stores are kind of a, a one type of that where you actually have the, um, the, the persistent volumes outside, stored outside the cluster and managed outside the cluster. And you can basically have something like this, like however you like, um, manage it however you like. Uh, 
and it's basically it connects over the network. Um, so you can also do things like uh, have a you know a MySQL or um, or another type of database that's actually managed and and uh, outside of your cluster. So you might have like say your company has a bunch of DBAs or something that um, that are are really good at, at managing databases, and so you know it's perfectly viable to actually just use that. Um, or you could use another managed service from from a cloud service, so something like Cloud SQL or like you know Cloud Bigtable or whatever, uh, those type of things. The the second kind of pattern is to kind of adapt it, adapt your your database to to run in the cluster. So um, so this is more maybe more along the lines of the uh, the the mounting the the persistent volumes, but um, so. Most software expects to be able to access the file system, so like basically have the file system state stored elsewhere. Um, so this is essentially like running MySQL or a type of database uh, on the on the cluster itself. And then the third is to actually have a cluster native kind of uh, application, so something that's um, was designed originally to run in clusters and kind of replicates the data around enough times that uh, it doesn't really matter if if uh, the um, if the containers get moved around a lot. Uh, you've replicated the data enough times that it's it's available for you uh, no matter what. This is actually pretty challenging. So, um, uh, but uh, it's it's definitely a a pattern or a, or a type of uh, pattern that you could actually have. So. The uh, the first pattern that I talked about uh, running outside the cluster is a um, uh, looks something like this. So essentially, you would have like uh, your containers running inside the cluster, and then um, talking to a service that's outside the cluster and, and completely managed outside. So adapting it to run in the cluster is is basically a uh, would be running it in a container inside the, the cluster and then accessing it over a service. Uh, or something like that uh, to get service discovery for it, but then basically just talking to that uh, and then that storing its own uh, physical like hard drive data uh, or file system data on a volume or something uh, analogous. And then lastly, the uh, the cluster native uh, approach is something looks something like this. Essentially, uh, each you have a bunch of nodes or a bunch of uh, of of, uh, of replicas of your of your database running, and each one of those will replicate data a certain number of times, um, and so that would actually uh, allow you to um, have a more kind of highly available uh, database. Uh, um, but you, there are a number of drawbacks to that. So in practical terms, you actually do need to have volumes attached to these, um, but. Um, theoretically, you could have something that would run without volumes that's that's ephemeral, uh, but you need to have uh, a little bit more guarantees. Like, um, like say, if you happen to have a database that has a uh, that replicates and has a quorum of like three uh, three nodes, then you have to make sure that all three of those those particular pods or containers are are not running on the same physical host uh, and things like that. So if the physical host goes down, then your data wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be lost. So um, one, I'm going to talk about a, 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 a concrete example. But um, basically, what you need to do is to determine your app's uh, data needs uh, for each of the uh, for the state that you need to store. Uh, so, so for things like cache, like you might not necessarily care as much as as something like your actual database, like your uh, your MySQL database or or Cassandra or whatever you happen to be running. So, so essentially, like the the outside the cluster, like the merits of actually using the outside of the the cluster pattern would be uh, that it's pretty easy. You don't have to really deal with the the nuances of actually running in the cluster, uh, and you may already have something uh, like this. So, like you might already have DBAs running at your machine or, or working at your company uh, that already manage uh, uh, SQL machines or MySQL machines, and you know they manage. Or they do a good job doing that, and you know they already have the infrastructure and everything in place, um, so you can just use it. That's that's one uh, definitely a viable option. Um, 
or you could like use, uh, like I mentioned, a, a cloud service. So cloud services are also things that are really, really easy to use. So you can just, um, because they're completely managed, you don't actually have to manage the physical machines. Um, and they also provide you with a lot of cool uh, uh, features like, like failover and, uh, and automation of backups and things like that. So adapting to run in the cluster um, is, is another uh, option. And um, so this is uh, really cool because like, you can you know, essentially run it inside the cluster and, and uh, it can, um, when you're running things like databases alongside other, other types of applications like web servers that, that kind of use CPU, you can actually uh, um, utilize the cluster a little bit more efficiently than you would uh, be able to uh, otherwise. Um, and you can basically restart the process on any node. So like if, you're, you're, if you had a MySQL like running outside of your cluster and it was running on one machine and that machine happened to explode, uh, then you'd be kind of in trouble. But if you happened to uh, adapt it to run in the cluster, you could kind of restart it on any other machine and uh, with a little bit of a, down, with a short downtime and uh, you'd basically be okay. Um, but obviously with things like this, you would really want to test your workload and make sure that uh, that you would get the the types of performance that you uh, that you that you want out of uh, some uh, running it inside the cluster. So things like the networking and uh, actually storing the volume, uh, storing data on a network volume, uh, will give you slightly different performance characteristics than actually running something outside the cluster on bare metal. So the the third uh, actual uh, the cluster native kind of approach. Um, so. There's, this is kind of a shout out to, uh, to a project that uh, was started at YouTube uh, called Vitesse. And Vitesse is essentially a, um, a sharded MySQL uh, server. Um, and so it kind of manages a bunch of MySQL shards and then kind of allows you to interact with it as if you're act interacting with one SQL server or MySQL server. And, um, and they've actually provided a, a number of um, of, of setup scripts and things like that that you can use to to run uh, Vitesse on Kubernetes uh, in a container cluster. So it's actually uh, kind of working in a in a containerized world. It's like it's a really pretty good example of how you would actually get that running. Um, it has a number of kind of services internally uh, to it uh, to kind of manage the shards and things like that. Uh, but it's really really uh, interesting. So. Um, there's actually um, the Kubernetes configuration uh, included in the uh, examples directory in the, on the uh, GitHub repository. So essentially, so just to kind of repeat it, like you need to like figure out your, your app's data needs. So like, uh, so uh, based on to, con and then consider the patterns uh, that I talked about here before actually um, implementing that in your, uh, uh, in your app for your application. So, like one of the uh, one of the things that I talked about earlier was the uh, the service abstraction. So you can definitely use that as part of um, actually trying to run things uh, natively in a cluster. And uh, you you will probably end up with uh, multiple data type of services. So you might have like one service that's uh, that's for your key value stores, or one one data service that's for your your MySQL service, uh, or um, and and cache and whatnot. Um, and you may even have like different ones for your users versus your your uh, your other types of application data, um, or or logs or things like that. And so um, this kind of uh, a service oriented architecture is is really the kind of way you want to go uh, with that. So um, kind of the last type of state that I want to talk about is uh, is uh, configuration, and. Um, and secrets. So, configuration is a is a kind of type is a kind of state uh, that uh, usually doesn't change. Uh, and in this case, I'm actually this is actually a immutable state. But um, so, in Kubernetes, what you can do is actually uh, you can configure containers with uh, with environment variables. So you can actually pass environment variables directly uh, to the containers when they start. Uh, so. So you can do things like uh, change uh, based on the context. So whether you're running in development or production or um, you're running on GCP versus your bare metal or your, your OpenStack uh, cluster or um, whatever. 
and other things like logging config or the name of your service for your, your backend, uh, backend database. But one thing that you don't really want to be storing in the, in the Kubernetes config files or, or in the, uh, the environment variables is, is passwords. So, you, you know, uh, storing passwords or, or um, SSA or keys, uh, kind of encryption keys and things like that. Um, you don't really want to be able to want to have to store those in your repository or in a, in a uh, text file. So what about these? So you can actually uh, store secrets in what's uh, called a secret file or, or a secret in, in Kubernetes. Uh, so you actually do create a file for this, uh, but you probably don't want to commit it to your repo because uh, um, the password data here or the data for each uh, individual secret is actually just base64 encoded. Um, so you would basically create this or this file and like and uh, and um, create it in Kubernetes, and then once you have a secret, uh, that secret is basically a, a, a written one time. Uh, you can't actually read the data from of the secret through the API anymore, uh, but uh, you can then. Uh, you can then mount uh, the the secrets as what's called a secret volume uh, to your to your container, and that's basically just a directory with a bunch with a bunch of text files that contain the uh, the data for each of the secrets. Uh, so that's a good way to um, make it so that your your application can read uh, those type of uh, secrets um, and passwords and things like that uh, without actually having to um, uh, interact with the API and send passwords over the wire and things like that. So to uh, to wrap up, like here's a here's a few um, kind of uh, other uh, resources that you can take a look at to uh, to, to learn more about con uh, containers and state and uh, how a cluster management works. Um, the first is a is a really good talk by Jack Wilkes, uh, and the the second link here is actually the um, the white paper that we at Google have uh, um, released uh, about Borg, which is our internal. Uh, um, container management system. Uh, so Kubernetes was based on Borg um, and uh, Kubernetes itself, uh, as well as uh, several patterns um, in Kubernetes. So the, each of these are um, uh, kind of talking about how to actually uh, create state or save state and stuff. So uh, in here is uh, some examples of um, how to run MySQL or Cassandra, uh, as well as how to use uh, secrets. Sorry about that. Everybody done taking photos? You're still taking photos. Uh, it's okay if you if you don't get a, didn't get a photo, then uh, I'll you can uh, I'll, I'll send you all of this, or you can take a picture of it from here or something uh, later. So uh, that's all I had for today. So uh, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, I hope you got something out of it. Um, I'll take some uh, some a few questions. Um, I think I have a few minutes, um, but it's so. If anybody has them, I'll take them right now. Yeah. Um, so let's say you have a Kubernetes pod with the high SCSI persistent volume attached, mm -hmm. and then uh, somehow that host or machine that the Kubernetes pod runs down goes down. Mm -hmm. um, how, how and the pod gets then relocated to another machine. Mm -hmm. So, so for like iSCSI, um, that would be something that like would have to be. Uh, I'm not really familiar, especially with uh, with iSCSI itself. Um, so, but uh, yeah, that would be how that would have to be something that would be managed for you uh, to to actually uh, move it to another uh, physical host uh, if you were running in a physical, uh, you know, environment or on bare metal. Um, Mm -hmm. Right. So um, the, you, you, show, you showed a few opportunities to it, uh, the Jeff about with things like NFS or, you know, right. right. So, but what about if my application now requires a block device and it needs to be moved across to another port? What, what would be the best approach? So in that sense, in that case, um, I don't think that currently like Kubernetes really has um, a way of setting like affinity to a particular host or something like that. Um, uh, so that would be something that, that would be a, a feature coming probably in the future. 
Um, but uh, basically, being able, like storing stuff on the host is is uh, going to be uh, you know you won't you won't have any guarantees that that your your container would be started on the same host again. Um, it does res kind of restart things on the same host uh, because um, you might be using things like host host uh, you know host directories or, or iSCSI or things like that that are running on the single host. Um, but obviously, if the host goes down, it will have to move the container somewhere else, and uh, then you're kind of out of luck. Yeah. So I don't really have a good op uh, option for you right now, but yeah. Right. Right. There's a couple things that you can do, like for for um, for processes to like make them uh, um, get shut down more gracefully. Um, but obviously, yeah, like if hosts explode or something like that, then you, you don't have guarantees in that sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Gosh, you guys are really easy. You shouldn't let me off like that. Somebody's got to have a hard question. That was actually a pretty hard question. But. OK. All right, well, if you, if you guys have any questions or you think of something later, then I'll, I'll kind of be around for a little while. Um, so uh, just come and grab me and um, ask away. Thanks a lot.